But the real meat and potatoes of this thing is the weekly. Um, and I'm going to switch to screen mode so you guys can see this better. I'll show you my. But this is essentially my my weekly. What I look at every day is it's how I keep track of, you know, the meetings that we're having and what I want to get done that day. I'm just going to. Can you see that? Looks like your mic's got a mind of its own. I know it keeps moving. Okay, so here's my December thing, and you can see I've uh, put lines on each of these things, so I could kind of say, "Here's what I want to do in the morning. Here's what I want to do in the afternoon. Here's what I want to do in the evening." Hello, everybody. Welcome to Three Point Perspective, the podcast about illustration, how to do it, how to make a living at it, and how to make an impact in the world with your art. I'm Jake Parker. I'm Lee White. And Will Terry is not with us today. He's on assignment because we are interviewing Jason Edmiston today, famous illustrator of uh, pop culture uh, icons from 80s and 90s. Uh, there's no chance you have not seen something he's done at some point, if you're at all like interested in, in pop culture stuff. A uh, quick little bit about him. He's Toronto-based. Uh, so he's super nice and kind cause he's Canadian. <laughs> um, I, I love perpetuating that, that stereotype <laughs> because like... I haven't met a mean, I, I, in my life I have not met a mean Canadian, but, um, he has been working for, uh, professionally since 96. And what was really cool about this interview is, um, and this is definitely an interview you're going to want to watch on YouTube because we do a lot of screen sharing, looking at his artwork and talking about his artwork. But um, he, what was cool about this interview is is seeing how deliberate he is with his career and how he never once let um, sort of outside forces choose for him what he should be doing. But steered his his ship where it needed to go uh I don't know, what was one of your big takeaways from this lee i mean that's sort of the way that my big takeaway as well like it, it it the interview with him made me sort of change my overall advice you know we have all this advice about how to do this thing and how to paint and how to draw and maybe we just have all this stuff and then really mm -hmm. it boils down to if if you're good you'll get work i mean I, when i was first <laughs> looking at his site I was thinking to myself, other, I mean, obviously moving posters would be an, an obvious call for mm -hmm. him, you know what I mean? Client right. work. But I was just thinking to myself, who pays this guy? You know what I mean? He's got all <laughs> this work. I just don't know. It's not part of my world. Yeah. Um, and, but he just made it. And, and so he's getting, he's getting cl client work that then he turns into fan work that then mm -hmm. he sells an original love. It, it's, it's, it's shocking. And it just comes down to the simple thing. Like he's really good at this thing that he's doing. And so like, you know, who, how do you market to get a pinball game? You know, where you're doing the art for a pinball machine, right? Well, it matches his work. So he gets the work, you know what right. I mean? He, yeah. He's just really good. That kind of sets the stage for who hires him. Yeah, exactly. So let's get right down into it. You're going to love this interview. You mentioned <laughs> earlier before before we recorded, before Lee came on, um, how you used to work in editorial. Yeah, yeah for 10 years. Um, yeah, oh, wow. and then you said you saw the writing on the wall and uh -huh. decided to make this career shift. Can you just like speak to that? Like what, yeah. were, the, what were the cues? Well, I got out of art college. I went. I was uh, talking to Jake, and I said I went to on, Ontario College of Art, which is now OCAD, Ontario College of Art, art and Design. It's a university now. Um, and when I went, I got out of uh, art college, and I just started working for local newspapers and magazines. Uh, uh, I'm, I live in Toronto, so we had you know Toronto Life and and Golf uh, Golf Digest and um, uh, Globe and Mail newspaper, Toronto Star, all these you know small Canadian and Toronto specific um, publications. And I was just cold calling art directors or sending out mailers. Uh, I, I, I got an um, art representation, you know, a few years into that um, and basically just did small spots and a few cover illustrations for magazines, um, even some national magazines. Um, but it was, you know, here's a picture of Tiger Woods doing something current. Uh, maybe he's, you know, holding up a broken, he, you know, maybe he's having a bad uh, run of, mm. of games or some, uh, ma you know, matches. I don't know anything about sports, sorry, guys. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and he's holding a broken club or something. And that's it. It's a, a caricature of, uh, of Tiger Woods. And they'd use that for a cover of a golf magazine or an interior contents page or something. 
And, you know, I'd have to give 30% of that to an agent on top of that. So, you know, I'm also slower. I'm working traditionally, or I was uh, solely working traditionally then. And, you know, it takes me two, three days to do an illustration for $500. And I have to give three, 30% of that to an agent. You know, it's so mm -hmm. hard to make a living as an editorial artist. So I'd really try to um, supplement that with some advertising gigs that tend to be, you know, maybe five times the, the budget of that. Or, mm -hmm. um, you know, I had, you know, I had my own web store just selling some fan art, you know, prints and stuff like that. And the, the more I was working in that editorial and advertising world, I was just thinking, I can't get a leg up because almost the work is uh, anonymous because you're not really be building a fan base like you would mm -hmm. in, in, um, in what do you call it in, um, consumer art, you know, uh, merchandise art. Um, you're, you're just kind of known by art directors. So it just gets more editorial mm -hmm. work and more advertising work, but the budgets were going down I, I'm talking about the writing on the wall, the budgets mm -hmm. were going down and down and down. And the newspapers used to be a couple inches thick and now, now they're like a flyer and they're not hiring as many <laughs> right. editorial illustrators. So the jobs were already poor paying poorly. They didn't increase the budgets even over a span of 10 years and there were less jobs. And there's more illustrators every year coming out of art college. It was right. a nightmare to try to get regular work. So I just said after, you know, eight, 10 years, forget this. I'm going to, um, well, maybe a little bit earlier than that. Cause I started to do comic conventions, um, mm -hmm. before that. And I wanted to get into toy packaging and doing movie posters and, and, and even comic book covers and stuff, you know, more pop culture art. That was what, what my love was. That was the thing yeah. that got me into art in the first place. So, while I still had an agent, I would pay for myself to go fly to San Diego Comic-Con or New York Comic-Con or in, in Toronto. I would fly myself there. I'd go in a hotel. I'd, uh, and I'd literally walk from one end of the convention to the other. It'd take me the whole run of the show, whether that's a three-day show or a five-day show. And I'd just take my portfolio and my hat in my hand and go from booth to booth to booth, <laughs> just snake the entire thing. And I'd talk to anybody that would talk to me and just said, here's my work. Can you give me some advice I want to do comic book covers or toy packaging or whatever. And I did that year show after show year after year, as I'm also doing editorial work, you know, mm -hmm. nine to five. And I started to get some traction. I started to get some odd comic book cover work or some toy packaging for Hasbro. That was probably my big break. I did some, um, some uh, GI Joe packaging, just some minor stuff, but still yeah. it was my foot in the door. And I still was had your, to get um, a percentage of that to my agent. Sorry, go ahead. Right. Let me ask you a question real quick. Um, so while you're doing that, was your um, ability and your style as established as it is now? I mean, like, or was it evolving at that time? Too? It I'm was, just wondering yeah. what it looked like. Yeah, It was evolving. It's funny. It's, it's almost like I had a style for editorial and advertising that was consistent. If you look through my really old stuff, it was fairly consistent. You know, although the editorial stuff tend to be more uh, a celebrity based. So it, it was the big head, small body kind of thing. Um, mm -hmm. that, which was the style at the time. Um, I sound like, uh, you know, uh, 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 grandpa, uh, Simpson, which was the style <laughs> at the time, uh, <laughs> but it was, it was, you know, the Anita Kuntz's of the world. Um, yeah. the Roberto Parada kind of style. So I was doing that, but then advertising was more realistic proportions, but the same type of painting style, mm -hmm. but my pop culture stuff tended to be a little bit more high contrast, a little bit more, um, saturated color, um, mm -hmm. a little bit more of me in it. Like, cause I really did anything that I wanted to do rather than trying to make my work fit what the art director wanted. So what you see now from my portfolio is basically what I was doing at the beginning of me showing. Mm. Gotcha. Uh, cultures, my heart, you know, that reason that I had in going out and that's pretty been pretty consistent you know, since 10 years ago, um, right up to current posters, it, you know, it's, it's gotten better and tighter and hopefully, but, um, it's pretty much the same as what I was hawking at the comic conventions back then. Mm -hmm. So seeing the writing on the wall, I was just thinking the, uh, something's got to change with my career. There's actually money in pop culture. It was growing and growing and, and editorial was shrinking and shrinking. And I, and I just talked to my agents and said, I think I'm going to make a go of this on my own. Cause I was, I was getting benefits from me promoting my own stuff and mm -hmm. I made a break with them and I promoted myself from then on. And, and my career just kind of kept doubling every year. It was, it was getting more and more work 
and the and the budgets were you know more lucrative i started doing art gallery shows like pop pop gallery shows like gallery 1988 and mondo mm-hmm. gallery and you know these sort of uh pop culture uh shows where they do you know let's do uh you know all movies from 1985 you know uh, yeah. or let's do a whole show based on um you know uh the movies of john hughes or something like that and then that mm-hmm. just kind of built my my reputation instagram built my reputation um you know and and the rest is is current history of the clients i have now so where you're at now in in uh you know currently wh- wh- what would you say your um like your yearly income is made up of what percentage of client work posters i see you're doing skate decks you're yep. i saw you know a helmet i don't know if that's oh, a commission yeah. dude let's talk about that that, like, that yeah, helmet yeah. is the coolest oh thanks. if you guys go to this guy's instagram <laughs> this helmet is just to describe it it's a full face helmet and it's like uh like a godzilla head all the <laughs> way or a like t-rex, a t-rex right? From, t-rex yeah um, yeah yeah it, it was all the for way a around gallery the whole show thing. yeah yeah it, oh, it was a fun project it wasn't a commission uh i can sell it but it was really just for a gallery show. It was um, put on by this famous uh, or curated by this famous design company out of California called Lincoln Design Co. And mm. uh, I met them in, through conventions and through a mutual friend. And But they were aware of my work and, and they liked it. And they said, hey, would you want to participate in this uh, 20, I think it's called 21 Helmets show. It was mm-hmm. for, a, um, for Icon um, uh, motorcycle helmets. And they donated the helmets and gave them to the artist and you could do whatever you want uh with um with this uh raw helmet so you know i i masked it off and i gessoed it and i and i decided to turn it into a t-rex so, so it's all cool. hand-painted acrylic um and then they included a few little um special colored accessories like uh you know uh the windscreen and the and the the the, the fins at the back some gold mm-hmm. gold accessories and stuff so uh, I chose those to to accent the helmet, but that I will sell that eventually if I don't just put it on my shelf. But it was really just for the promotional effect of having it in the show. So that was more of a spec project. I don't do those too often, um, just mm-hmm. because you know there's there's a lot of you know uh, uh, you know gigs you got to do first and pay the bills, but. That one it's was for fun, fun just to be a part of it. Yeah, yeah. Dude, and it's, I, w- I would think it's that nice, would be the you know? perf- perfect gig for licensing that, like, you have this great demo piece. Have you talked to helmet companies that actually make custom helmets? Because I, I, I would think yeah. they'd be all over that. I haven't yet. Um, it was really difficult to design in 3D for me because I'm such a 2D-minded person mm-hmm. that, I mean, I can I can draw light and shadow and all that, but to, to imagine things, excuse me, in three dimensions... Mm-hmm. It's a little bit difficult to kind of wrap my head around it. Uh, now, this one was just skinning something essentially that was already three dimensions. Right. Um, but then all these other challenges come in, like how do you do light and shadow on something that's in 3D that, you know, basically is going to have its own light and shadow in, in mm-hmm. reality anyway. So I just decided, okay, every all the light's coming from above. So there'll be, you know, simple shadows below, right. you know, and then I'll just keep that consistent throughout. So it was a challenge for sure. You can, if you see those close-up shots, you can see all the like, literally the 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 paint on top of each other, like the texture of all the brush strokes, so you know, cool. multiplying. Uh, but that adds some, you know, interest to it, right? It's a one of a yeah. kind piece. Um, it's really that cool. one's really fun. Thanks, thanks. It was cool to try to uh, to try to make the like the I don't know what those parts are in the in the crooks of the mouth, like the the like the venom kind oh. of stretchy the red part. Yeah, and it oh, worked yeah, out yeah. perfectly that that went right over where the where the the hinge guard was. So it just worked mm-hmm. out, uh, you know. It, it was it allowed me to extend the mouth and make it look bigger. So it was kind of a visual uh, cheat, if you will. Yeah, it's it's really really cool. Thank you. Um, but yeah, going back to the <clears throat> my initial question. So um, you know, in a year, how many? movie posters will you do right. how much client work will you get like how do you how do you break that down and and how much of it is a personal project like this you know sure um personal projects probably only one or two a year that, that i'm just doing literally just for fun um i mean all it's honestly it's all for fun i can't remember the last time i did a job and and hated it 
uh, which I'm very <laughs> fortunate for that. Maybe, uh, you know, five years, the last time I took a job that I felt I had to for the money and, um, and didn't enjoy it uh, or, mm-hmm. or kind of got, you know, uh, kind of got, uh, uh, caught, caught with the money, um, aspect of it kind of like, Oh, well, I can't really turn it down, but then I, Oh, I hate it. It, it would, you know, it, it, that's a good sign that my career is going in the right direction, that, um, it, everything has been really fun to work on. Mm-hmm. So, um, if you look at my actual client work, I, I work regularly for Mondo who's known for kind of alternative movie posters and vinyl and, and toys and stuff like that. Um, I haven't done as many posters as usual for them, but I'm getting back into it. Uh, just the way that my career is shaken out. So say I would do one or two posters a year. Um, and I would do toy packaging on a regular basis for super seven. I'm doing, I did all their, um, uh, reaction figures for their Motu line, their, uh, master of the universe line. And mm-hmm. now I'm doing all of their, uh, or most of their reaction figures for GI Joe. Um, so they're like three and three quarter inch figures that are very simple. Uh, I think five points of articulation, like the old Kenner action figures, uh, yeah. but in the style of GI Joe. So I'm doing all the packaging art for that kind of in a, in a retro style, you know, with the explosion behind them. And, um, yeah. I've got uh, one. Just yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's that's their alien figure. Um, that's just a photo. Uh, and, but a lot of those packaging, uh, they have different artists do the packaging art. Um, Ed Repka does a lot for them. You should have um, gotten this job. The, you lost. <laughs> you lost work to a photographer. I did. I did. Damn <laughs> photographers. Uh, Ed Repka works a lot for them. He's best known for doing all the uh, all the uh, like thrash metal album art, uh, specifically uh, Megadeth. Mm-hmm. He did um, all those album covers. So he works a lot for them. Even my uh, my friend from Toronto, Matt Tobin, does some packaging art for them. But I, I've you know I've done stuff for them for Monsters, mm-hmm. um, They Live, um, RoboCop. Um, but GI Joe is my regular gig for them now. Maybe uh, once a quarter they'll give me, um, which is you know once every three months they'll give me here's you know twenty new figures we need illustrated or 50, you know what happened, 10, 10 figures or something. Maybe twenty yeah. is too much. But. Say, and you're know, still, do, are you doing that digitally now or, or no, still it's traditional? All, I'm, com- I'm, I'm, uh, I'm combining it digitally because I painted the background separately. So it's the same background explosion rather than painting it again each time. And the, and the, and the, uh, that's painted with acrylic. And then the figures are also painted by hand in acrylic. Cause I wanted that traditional look. Also, I wanted to be able to sell the paintings. So all the, all the figures are, are painted traditionally, except if there's a variant, like say there's a, 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 um, a, a ninja who's white, I painted him white and then they want to do a red variant. They'll do mm. a digital, either I will, or super seven will have their guys do a digital, uh, tint shift on that. Um, but for the most part, all the figure art that I do is uh, traditional mainly mm-hmm. because I want to be able to sell the originals as an additional point of my income. So you're asking percentages of what I to get back to your question five minutes ago. I'm sorry. <laughs> that right. My client, my client work is like say 60%, 70% of my day, whether that mm-hmm. be movie posters, uh, uh, skateboard decks, uh, vinyl albums, uh, toy packaging. And then say, uh, 30% would be convention, uh, self, uh, initiated convention art where I'll release art prints, um, at you know New York Comic Con, San Diego Comic Con, Designer Con, and then the last ten percent will be private commissions, uh, or mm. selling original art from all of those other jobs. Um, so it's you know it, it can the percentages can can fluctuate wildly depending on what kind of year I've had, but that's essentially what it shakes out to be. I mean, I do odd jobs every now and then, like I designed the uh, official Halloween pinball machine uh, last year all the art on the mm-hmm. machine um all the all the sides and the backboard and even the play field uh and he, they even took some of the art and animated it um at rudimentary animation and put it in the video screen of the of the pinball machine too so that was more of a labor of love because the the budget was so low on that and i worked on it for like five months but where i will make my money back on that is i have all the art that i made for that piece was all traditional so I have all the mm. pencils and then because of how I, I don't paint on my pencils, I tra- I transpose the pencils to a board and then I paint on those. So I have all the pencils for those pieces and then I have mm-hmm. all the paintings separately for those pieces mm-hmm. and I will be selling all of that art eventually. So I will make far more, hopefully, 
uh, Halloween fans are rabid. Uh, and mm -hmm. I have a fairly good following for my original art. So hopefully if I sell all of that art, that will, you know, be multiple times more than I got paid for the original job. Um, yeah. but I had that in mind when I made it. And that's why I made that art traditional. I could have done it a lot quicker digitally, but that would have been the end of any kind of, uh, sales from that work. And that's right. what I, I build on that technique where I'll do the, the actual piece digital. And then mm -hmm. I use that basically as a really finished color study for sure. the traditional piece, which mm -hmm. I didn't sell. Yeah. Yeah. Um, you're just re doing it uh, retroactively, but it's the same amount of labor. Same idea. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But I'm glad to hear you're doing that because for sure it is, I, 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 I always recommended that model to my students. Like there is a market for original artwork and we're making all this artwork anyway. Yeah. Um, and I rarely have hear people doing that, like selling it in so many different ways. Like you have your client sell and then the original sell and then possibly print sales Absolutely. Yeah. as well. And so it's a three, you know, kind of a three prong uh, approach. Snow, also, if Right. You own the uh, sorry to cut you off, but if you own the license, the 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 license, yeah. or at least you own the license for that image, say like say I did a piece for uh, just because I wanted to go on that point. Sorry to cut you off, but to that point exactly, I did a licensed piece for a DVD release of Child's Play, hmm. and they and I guess uh, Warner Brothers or whoever owns that uh, property, they own the the image. You know, sorry, they own the 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 character, but I own the right. image. So mm. I did the painting traditionally. They paid for the rights to use it for the DVD. I sold the painting and I sold the pencils and I got the license to sell prints later. And then also when it gets relicensed because um, Fright Rags or whoever wants to come up with a t-shirt, they came to me and although they had the license for the character, they had to pay me to use the image again. And that was also mm. made into a toy. So I sold that one Im image like three or four times and sold the original and <laughs> sold prints. So you basically take, so imagine how many hours you spend on that image from, from client calling you to you completing it three, four days, you know, mm. in five days at most, you've turned those five days into multiple revenue streams. So mm. you try to maximize that work as much as possible because you've already done the work. Why not sell it, you know, five, six, seven times. Uh, and I hear you guys talking about that. And I want to encourage other artists to do that as well. I just think too many artists are working solely digital and that's the end of their, you know, their work, you know, right. when right. they complete it, that's it. They'll sell it once and that's it. So one little so happy to hear question in, in the middle of that, you, you just, you said that you got the license for, for the image after yeah. Warner brothers. How did you go about doing that? I can do that. Well, that's a kind of a, a regular, um, a semi-regular way that I'm starting to do more now. Like I've, I've, I've sold, you know, my, I, I know you guys have on smaller, uh, in a, to smaller degrees at, at some points in your careers, I've sold prints or put images of fan art in books or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's, it's, it's kind of a gray area. And, and I know, you know, some, some companies, uh, you know, look the other way because it's positive promotion. Some kind of like, you no, know, you, you know, that's our property. You have to pay us for the license. So it's, mm -hmm. you know, if do it your own risk. <laughs> that right. being said, I, I now I'm getting my own licenses directly from the license holders because once you start doing uh, 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 official licensed work, you have a little bit of um, uh, you know whatever you call it, uh, reputation or juice in the industry or whatever you want to call it. You mm -hmm. can actually find out contact info for these license holders and go directly to them and say, hey, I want to put out a poster for Halloween, or I've gone to Elvira's uh, estate. Or I've gone to you know 2000 AD to get a Judge Dredd license, or uh, all these different you know Miramax I've talked to to get my own license, and they you know you negotiate a percentage or a flat fee or something, and they'll give you a contract to do a print release based on a pitch, and I've taken that percentage or sorry I've taken that deal and I've gone and made some art you know that's approved by them and and above board done my run of prints, you know, also given them a, uh, a smaller percentage of um, samples for their archives and then paid them 15% or a flat fee or mm -hmm. something up front. And uh, we all make money on it. And, mm -hmm. and I'm thinking, well, why didn't I do this earlier? I don't need a company to work for when I can go directly to the source and license it from them. I don't need to go to a t-shirt company that has the Nightmare on Elm Street license and just get paid a flat fee. I can go right to, uh, you know, New Line or whoever owns mm -hmm. it now and say, I want to do a, a Freddy poster. And they say, okay, we want 15%. And I can do a run of 300 posters and make a few thousand dollars, you know, mm -hmm. uh, or even $10,000, right. depending on if you sell 300 posters, screen print posters for 60 bucks a piece or whatever. 
and the original art on top of that, you know, like mm -hmm. it's, it, it really is much smarter if you have the ability to, to go directly to the licensor. I think they just try to teach you when you're young that, oh, you need a company to do that because they don't want you going directly to the company. They don't want you to know the secret uh, handshake uh, to get in the back door. <laughs> but once you know, it's it's not, not that hard. <laughs> you just do it yourself, you know? Right. And, and, I would and, think that would help sales too because you could even say, oh, this is officially licensed yeah. from the, you know, it just looks more official and, and higher higher profile. Totally. Yeah, absolutely. It gives you It gives you some weight and then other companies will approach you directly knowing that you're kind of, a, a legitimate uh, company, you know, not trying to, uh, you know, just put out bootleg products. Because even the biggest companies, a lot of them started out doing bootleg releases until they got big enough where they're like, oh, no, we have to actually get licenses now. You know, I won't name <laughs> any companies, but I mean, there's a lot of them that you're aware of that, that that's how they started out their business model. And now, now they're all legitimate because it's it's too big to, to you know, right. run rough shot, right? So. Right, right. I want to talk about your series of uh, eyes that you're doing. Sure. Uh, when did that start? What What is, just tell us about it. Like, yeah. why? Why? <laughs> why? <laughs> My parents asked that. Why, dude? <laughs> People still like this? I'm like, yeah, they, they still seem to be into it. Um, my series, uh, Eyes Without a Face, uh, started back in 2015. And I'll tell you the impetus for it. Um, I noticed a lot of artists in the pop culture scene um, were starting to um, uh, do series based on, uh, you know, uh, kind of a repeating theme. So, okay, I'm going to do like, you know, like a Mike Mitchell might do, mm -hmm. okay, I'm going to do fat birds or I'm going to do uh, portraits of pop culture people, uh, their profile portraits, you know, looking at them from the side. And it's a, it's a repeating uh, imagery mm -hmm. Where, yeah. uh, where, uh, uh, you know, it's the same style, same format, same composition, but the the thing that changes is the content. So mm -hmm. I was trying to brainstorm and think of some series that I could do that would be um, that be kind of in the same vein that would that would be my own that, that spoke to things that I was interested in, and I love doing pop culture portraits, and I had done series of pop culture portraits before um, for Mondo and for uh, art galleries and, and, and other companies. But I wanted to have something that kind of was my own thing that I mm -hmm. could offer at conventions or I could have gallery shows with. And this was a way of scratching that itch of doing a pop culture portrait, but, but boiling it down to the with almost like the bare minimum of what they all have in common that would engage the viewer. So I, you know, you've seen it before mm -hmm. where people have done, okay, I'm going to do all the, all the gloves from superheroes. So you've got Spider-Man's web glove and you've got Wolverine's claws and you've yeah. got, uh, you know, it, it, it has some kind of legs to it, but it's limited because, you know, some characters don't have hands or they've got tentacles or they've got, you know, whatever. And I'm like, what's more engaging and what would be more difficult to do where you almost weed out the people that would avoid it because it's too difficult to, to render a likeness. And I said, mm -hmm. oh, what about if I just focused on eyes? Like, and it's also cinematic because it, 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 it references the, the cinematic close-up because mm -hmm. most of the characters are movie-based. They're horror characters or they're, they're pop culture, you know, anime or, or you know, they're people that have been in movie or TV shows for the most part. There's also singers and video game characters and, and right. just celebrities. Um, but for the most part, they're, you know, movie and TV characters. And they've all done that close up in, in a widescreen shot where it's just zooming in on their eyes. And like, that is so effective and mm -hmm. so ubiquitous to pop culture. I bet I could do a whole series of pop culture paintings where it's just their eyes and it would be instantly recognizable and interesting. All yeah. out with new uh, properties and it worked. <laughs> I can't believe, but it worked. I pitched it to Mondo and they're like, Oh, this could actually make sense. So, so show us some mock-ups to show how tight you'd crop in because that's important. Like, do you show a bit of the mouth? Do you show the ears? Do you show mm -hmm. some of the hair? Like how much of that image do you crop it and still keep it, um, uh, you know, still honor the, the, uh, the, the spirit of the series. So right. I did some different ratios and figured out kind of this golden ratio uh, for the, the crop. And every portrait 
no matter how big I paint it. And I, I, I try to, as a, as a technical exercise, I, I try to paint every portrait one to one scale. So mm -hmm. I, I paint all the humans at human scale. So if you were to put it up to your face, it would be relatively within the same size as a human's eyes. Uh... And I, and I paint, you know, monsters, their actual size. I've even painted King Kong that was eight feet wide. I painted a state puff <laughs> marshmallow so cool. man was literally 21 feet wide. There's a picture of me in, standing in front of it on my Instagram mm -hmm. from the gallery show I had, um, where it's 21 feet wide and nine feet tall. Um, so everything is painted. Thank you. Every, everything is painted one-to-one -one scale. The only thing that is consistent is that all the characters are looking down the barrel of the camera. They're all looking mm -hmm. directly at the viewer. I, I've broken the rule just like a couple times specifically for those characters that make sense. But for the most part, they're all looking down the barrel and it's all cropped to the same ratio. It's uh, For human size, it's essentially six and a quarter by two and a half. It's not mm -hmm. like I didn't want to make it, you know, round it to a an exact inch or half inch or whatever, because I, I, I wanted it to be proper mm -hmm. a crop, like what makes sense to like looking through, um, you know, like when you go to a speakeasy and you slide that, that, yeah. that little slot open, I wanted it to have that kind of effect. So every character has that same ratio. If I blow it up, they are all at the same rectangular ratio. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's the only two rules I have with the pieces. Um, and for the most part, they're painted on wood panel. And if they're really big, they're painted on stretch canvas. But that's pretty much the rules of the of the pieces. Where I've broken the rules is uh, Jack Nicholson from uh, The Shining, where he's uh, breaking through the door and he's kind of looking yeah. to the side at Wendy. That's such a heavy and, and well-recognized scene that I broke the rules for that. And also Bubbles from um, Trailer Park Boys, if you know that show, he's got these big oversized glasses and his eyes yeah. are always kind of bugged out and he's kind of looking to the side. Uh, so I broke the rules for that, but you know, but for the most part, it's always uh, right at the viewer because uh, it, mm -hmm. it's the most engaging. And I also challenge myself to try to make them seem recognizable, even if they don't have that thing that makes them, Oh, well that's clearly, you know, uh, Voldemort because you can see the, the top of his nose is gone or that's clearly, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, I don't know somebody with, with a recognizable hairstyle, like, uh, right. you know, what does, like, I had a few characters that were just based on their, you know, their unique human appearance, like a, like a Steve McQueen from bullet, you know, yeah. his bright blue eyes and kind of how he's a little wrinkly and he's got that suntan kind of look, but he's still recognizable. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, that was the challenge and it's, it's kind of like, I am, I'm making it, hard on myself to do because that will limit the amount of copycats that will mm -hmm. follow suit. And if I ever do see copycats do this series, it's always something very simple, like anime characters, mm. you know, it's never, yeah. it's never, yeah. okay, here's uh, you know, here's Abe Lincoln, <laughs> you know, it's like, right. okay, that's too hard. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you can. Man, I, what's what's yeah, crazy about this, in. what's crazy about this series to me, two things is that, how insanely identifiable these are. Like I can mm -hmm. recognize every single one of them and I'm not a big pop oh, culture great. follower, um, but I can recognize every single one of them. Um, and they're so Perfect. different. And ex uh, just to highlight what you said, you picked a project that was right in your wheelhouse. I mean, mm -hmm. I couldn't yeah. do a single one of these things. If you, I mean, it doesn't even matter <laughs> if it's like super identifiable, like somebody wearing a patch, you still wouldn't be able to know who it is. I'm terrible <laughs> at like, likenesses. <laughs> and um, so, so you're right. I mean, you limited how much people can follow you down this road because it's so incredibly difficult and, and, and very specific. And like you said, you've got a, it's not just painting a, a painting of somebody. It's like what makes them look the way they do and kind of the, the call out to the character that they're actually playing. And um, it's, it's, if you guys go to his Instagram page and just scroll it's just shocking. Like every single one of them is right on the money and so high level. Mm -hmm. Oh, thank you so much. That that's, that's very high praise. I appreciate it. Um, it, it, uh, it's, it's, it's been a lot of fun and every now and then I'll get somebody asking me, so you're still doing these, eh? Or, or how long do you think you can do these? And I, I, I just answer I forever. I, yeah, I, there's no end. <laughs> I, I made a list once, uh, while I was driving, um, uh, um, uh, and, uh, I was thinking, how many could I do? And I just, I ended up making a list 
when I got home, like on my phone of like 200 characters I could do. <laughs> and then since then my phone list has, has, you know, increased to like 600 and I've painted 400 already. And I don't think Holy there's an cow. end in sight. There's so many different iterations and there's so many new characters coming out. Um, I did two gallery, two full gallery shows already uh, at Mondo gallery in Austin mm-hmm. Uh, once in 2015, once in 2017 or 18, I think. And uh, we are planning another. Um, and I have a, a big series planned um, that hasn't been announced yet uh, for a specific property that will just be a, a whole series based on this one property. Mm. Um, I'll be, anou- be able to announce soon, but I'm really excited about that. Um, I, I bet I can guess. Uh, but, don't publicly. <laughs> you can ask me. Out. <laughs> I'm seeing a couple of blind spots uh, on here that you haven't really approached yet. So uh, right, I'm, right, yeah, you might be able to guess. We'll keep that on the down low for for now. Okay, but, uh, okay. But I, yeah, it might be pretty obvious, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm super excited about that. And uh, yeah, I've, I've I think I've done about 400 portraits for now, and including uh, myself and my father who's like a regular, uh, model for me. Um, mm-hmm. that's another interesting story, but, um, and also variations this on is it. Great. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've painted, uh, Jason Voorhees five times and, you know, there's all different types of characters that have had mm-hmm. so many different iterations with their makeup. I love special effects makeup and monster movies and, and all that. Yeah. So it's, it's really my love letter to, um, character design, to be honest. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it sort of reminds a... me of the. Um, do you ever play that exquisite corpse games when you're yes. younger? Where you, if you did noses and and mouths, this would be so fun to mix and match. Oh, you know, for sure. Tom, Tom Cruise's eyes with with Predator's mouth. You know, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> oh, if you could stop there for a second, uh, Jake. That mm-hmm. one. Uh, that this is fine. One. That was actually another case where I got the license from Casey Green, um, who's famous for doing the "This Is Fine" dog uh, cartoon. Yeah, uh, among other the things. Dogs. That's just one. It's cartoons. Yeah. It's just a dog sitting in a fiery room, you know, drinking coffee. He's like, uh, this is fine. Like, you know, <laughs> my life isn't falling apart, you right. know? And, and I felt that that was the, the quintessential uh, meme of, you know, 2020 or 2021. Oh, yeah. So I approached him and said, Hey, um, and I also broke the rules on that one just because that, that image of his is so well known. I said, Hey, could I, no one would recognize it if it was straight on. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. Nobody would recognize it. So I had to break the rules and make it exactly the proportions of the panel and Mm -hmm. then, um, uh, you know, paint it in my style and he was up for it. So, uh, that was a a really cool one. And then for (laughs) some of the prints as a variant, I think, uh, maybe for 10 of the print run, I Mm -hmm. literally took a, uh, a match and burnt, uh, 10 of the prints. So it was kind of like, a uh, you know, almost like performance art. (laughs) And I sold those as burnt variants and uh, people ate it up. They really liked it. Yeah. It's, it was kind of a fun addition to the, you know, a fun chase to include. Wow. So I want to ask, I want to ask, um, and this is something I've been asking professionals lately is at some point you, there was a fork in the road in your life and it was, do I, is art a hobby or do I make a career out of it? And I'm wondering how you decided, you know, I'm just going to make a career out of this. And, and I, I guess what led to that decision and, mm-hmm. and what advice you would give to people who are at that crossroad? Oh man. Uh, I, I don't know about being at that crossroad specifically because I knew I wanted to be an artist at four, like a professional okay. artist at four. <laughs> I never uh-huh. had anything else that I wanted to do. And, and it's, it's, it's a weird obsession for me, but mm-hmm. uh, it probably a little bit of that was um, my father. Uh, uh, it was a, um, uh, until recently was a uh, 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 architectural draftsman. So mm-hmm. he was, you know, drawing additions to, himself and, and sorry I can you you out cut out for just a second there can you re- can you repeat that oh sorry you said your father yeah, so my father was an architecture yeah my father was an architectural draftsman and um and he could also draw in his own right um mm-hmm. when he was young but he just did it more as a hobbyist but i got a kick out of seeing the magic of of there's something you guys probably get this but there's something magical about seeing some a blank piece of paper and then seeing somebody draw on it and it turning into something. I don't know mm-hmm. what it is. It's like a, it's a, it really is like a magic trick. 
And I wanted to do that my whole life. And I found out I had, I guess, natural ability. You know, I could draw Garfield from memory, that sort of thing, when I was really young. And kids would want me to draw robots or monsters or, or you know, superheroes or something when I was young. And that was the thing that I guess made me special. And I got, um, you know, gratification from, from being able to do something and being known for that. So it just built on it. It just snowballed. And I ne I really just got a, a visceral kind of enjoyment from, from drawing. So I never wanted to do anything else. I'm like, oh man, if I could have a, li if I could make a living being Frank Frazetta or, mm -hmm. you know, uh, who, who Jim Davis or, I don't know who, who the guy who does the packaging art for, you know, uh, for, um, for GI Joe or, or he man, you know, man, that would be the dream. And I, and I did it. <laughs> I mean, I actually didn't do anything else except work towards that goal. And I, and I made it happen. So mm -hmm. if you're at the crossroads, you got to really ask yourself, like, what do you love doing more than anything? And do you love this enough to almost sacrifice anything else for it? Mm -hmm. Because that's, that's really what it takes. I knew you guys have worked, you know, longer than nine to five hours and you've sacrificed time um, in many ways to achieve this thing. But it literally takes that amount of uh, obsession and interest in it for most people. I mean, there are the, you know, rest in peace, Kim Jong Ji's of the world that maybe had a little bit more natural, you know, talent flow out of them than the, than the average person. But for the mm -hmm. most of us, we really had to work and practice at that ability that natural, you know, whatever natural ability you start with, you really had to cultivate that to be really good at it at a professional level, because you're competing against other maniacs that are also doing that. So if you want to get hired, you got to be as obsessed as they are. So that was just in my head from the very beginning. Um, so I, mm -hmm. I just did that, you know, mm -hmm. and it worked out, um, you know, for better, or for worse, that's where I came to this conclusion, but I never really wanted to do anything else. If I couldn't do this, I think I'd be eternally, uh, uh, melancholy if I couldn't actually make a living <laughs> at it. So that's what drove me. I'm like, I'm not going to be sad because I'm working at a, at a job that, that doesn't give me fulfillment. I want to do what mm -hmm. I want for a living. You know, I want to get up and go, I'm excited to work on this today. You know, because, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, you do work more than anything else in your life, right? You might as well be enjoyable. Right. Let me ask you a question based on that. And so looking through your portfolio, one thing that's, that strikes me is you're, you're amazingly consistent. Um, you're really good at what you do. And, and it seems very inspired by, like you were saying, movie posters, um, uh, and that, that kind of genre. Uh, I, I, I guess I'd like to ask you about how, what you would say to other people who struggle to find that consistent style. Cause even with me, I do have a pretty consistent illustrative style, but then mm -hmm. I'll go in and I'll do, you know, 20 paintings of, of like almost a la prima blimps or something, because I, <laughs> I'm just <laughs> yeah. kind of all, all over the place. And the second I, I'm too long in one area, I'm kind of looking over and wanting to do something else, but yours is so consistent. So do you have a secondary kind of style or you're just like, no, this is my thing and get out of my way. It's mostly, most of the stuff kind of come, pours out of me looking like this. Um, I do have another uh, ink style that looks a little bit different. I have a, another, speaking of the series, like the Eyes Without a Face, I have a few other series that are kind of a regular, uh, you know, uh, that kind of drumbeat of the same format, but and the same type of imagery. Like I do a series of uh, black and white uh, horror houses, you know, based on horror movies, but they're all in a square format. They're all painted black and white with just one, highlight of red but they're painted essentially in the same style as the rest of my stuff but i have this other style that's called swatches that is um uh, that i call it that and it's it's basically black acrylic ink drawings i call it ink drawings because it's black acrylic but i don't do blending it's it's more like it like i'm using india ink but with, just with black acrylic and i do that on uh paint swatches that you, you get from uh you know Home Depot. And they actually, they look like that painting right there, that, that Nightmare on Elm Street. They kind of look more like that style, like really mm -hmm. draggy and drippy. Like if you're just looking at the blacks, they look mm -hmm. more like that. Um, and that's different than my painted style because it's a little bit more um, a la prima, as you say. It's like, it's, it's not really blended. I don't go back with white. It looks more like that one as well, which is just basically black acrylic kind of sketchy. Cool. So I have that style as well. But I, I, um, I don't work in that style too often. That was kind of my early screen print style. Now my new screen print style ends up looking like my paintings, like the Texas Chainsaw mm -hmm. one. That's, a, that's an acrylic painting that I, um, 
that I that I digitally separated uh, for a screen print. Um, yeah, the Killer Clowns is more right like here. my older. Yeah, the Texas Chainsaw is, is is that's what my modern poster style looks like, and it's essentially a um, uh, my my full color painting style. Now, an interesting story about that one is that was painted only in black and white. Uh, really? And, and then I scanned it and I digitally colored it in layers and each layer is a different ink. So when it's screen printed, like a yellow layer will go down and then like a peach and then a, and then more of like a magenta and then a green and a black. It might be like a nine color screen print, but that started out as a black and white painting that I then colorized or whatever you want to call it digitally in Photoshop, but in separate color layers that get printed so they- one at a time. Wow, so it's it's it essentially gives a four color offset yes. look, but it's screen print. Yes, I deconstructed That's incredible. four color printing. Wow. I can actually also take a I, I invented a method of separation where I'll take a full color painting as well. Uh, I'm not sure if I have anything on my portfolio. On my Instagram I probably do. Oh, that uh was that one painted? This one? No, that was yeah, that Evil Dead was painted in black and white as well and then digitally colored. Um I have, uh, what did I do? Oh, if you see my uh, Creature from the Black Lagoon screen print, uh, you can probably Google search that or it's on my Instagram. That was a full color painting that I then separated digitally um, Mm -hmm. into nine colors, I think. Oh, oh, scroll back up, sorry. There, um, Jake, um, if you scroll back up to the uh, Invisible Man, uh, right there. No, no, down. Right here. On the left, there's an invisible man. One more. Scroll oh, right one here. More. There you go. On the bottom left. There you go. So those are two different colorways of the, of, the, uh, of the poster. But I'll tell you, I painted the one on the left in full color acrylic by hand. And then I digitally separated it into mm-hmm. transparent ink. So it turned into like nine colors. Mm-hmm. And then it was, I basically recreated four color process, but in nine colors. So they're nine, like nine color pr- process, I guess. That's, and then in order to make crazy, the, <laughs> and then in order to make the variant, I changed the colors. I, I added mm-hmm. a color, color adjust layer, and I just dialed in different colors until I got a more blue and purple color shift. And then those became the new nine layers. And then that became the variant. <laughs> it, and I invented that. Yeah. I'm very proud yeah. of that because there's nobody else doing that. I mean, yeah, there's, there's people doing separations and kind of, you know, separating flat paintings into into posters. But I'm actually oh. getting experience by dialing in uh, different amounts of cool and, and warm. And they're all transparent inks, by the way, too. So these are all multiply layers. They aren't opaque mm. layers. They're, mm. The only opaque layer would be the black layer on the top and probably the yellow layer or the very first layer on the bottom. Those are opaque right. layers, opaque inks, and the rest in between are like transparent inks. So basically, imagine a watercolor painting mm-hmm. as you've painted it. Uh, Lee, you can probably uh, imagine this uh, the, the best, or, or Jake with your, with your marker renderings. Imagine how you created that, uh, that watercolor or, or ink sketch where the inks add on top of each other to make the final drawing and you, and you finish it off with black ink on the top or whatever. Right Mm -hmm. now, imagine that in the computer separating it, you're Mm -hmm. basically, you, you pull it apart from each other and then you print each of those colors one at a time. So then when you make the screen print, you're essentially making uh, a a watercolor painting at a time by putting down a yellow and then an orange and then a blue and then a black um, and you rebuild it. With you're like frying my brain it's like saying now uh you mix the the cream into the coffee now pull the cream back yeah. out of the coffee yes. right. <laughs> yeah. it, can is, you imagine? it is essentially like that it is essentially like that it's, can it's, you imagine it's almost... how the um how the how the printer feels when they see him walk in the door oh They're yeah they like, don't oh, like no. yeah. it's, oh, it's, it's, here we it's, go not this it's guy. difficult <laughs> yeah it's difficult to print you have to have a really high-end printer to do it usually dl uh dl screen printing out of seattle uh handles my prints but um that is a sideline business for me too, where I, where I take uh, flat paintings and disassemble them so that they're able to be printed. I just recently did that for my hero. It was it's such a thrill. Uh, the late, great uh, Frank Frazetta did a painting for, uh, from dusk till dawn. 
I that saw was that. Not I was. Uh, that's incredible. That's so and, cool. And, Thank you. It was a big job for me. I can't take credit for the art, but I, I can take credit for the technical aspect of it. Basically, mm -hmm. they wanted to make a screen printable poster of it. So I took the high res file that was supplied by the Frazetta estate and I deconstructed it and separated it so that it could be reprinted as a screen print. Um, and you're asking, well, why didn't you just print it as a litho because he could, or a G clay or whatever, because you could just take the file and just print it out as is. And there's a certain amount of collectors that love the screen printed poster uh, mm -hmm. aspect where every it's almost more handmade because the inks are one on top of each other and there's, yeah. there's little idiosyncrasies in each print so it makes it mm -hmm. more unique mm -hmm. so there's a certain collector base that wants that so in order to create that i had to break it apart and it, it's not as much a technical thing you can do it technically where you you do like color range selections where you select okay all the black and you you select it and then you copy it and then pull it out and that's mm -hmm. your blacks and you can do that for the oranges and the reds and the blues. But then what you end up with is a, it's almost like a puzzle, but with a few pieces missing because there's some information that the color range doesn't uh, accept because there's the blends in between. So I'm basically make a rough cut by pulling all the, all the colors apart. I put it back together with, with opaques and transparencies and I overlay them and kind of make a rough cut of the poster. And I mm -hmm. go, okay, what am I left with? What's missing? And I go back in there and I, I literally hand paint in the missing areas like a, uh, uh, a fine art uh, oil painter, oil painting restorer would. Right. Like right. when you've got an old, old master's painting that's missing some data and you mm -hmm. have to paint in the missing area, I'm doing mm -hmm. that. So it's, wow. it's, half, it's a half technical copy and it's a half mm -hmm. forgery. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there's a, mm -hmm. a there's a lot of me in that poster even though it looks exactly like frank frazetta's work i'm right. basically copying his work based on the file if that makes sense just so it can be printed no that's really cool and I'm essentially and what, you, copying. what you're telling me uh, everything that you've told us today essentially is this is how you ai proof your career <laughs> like yes what you're doing, an AI can't do. Like you, no. you've got such a substantial uh, amount of your income that comes from originals, and mm -hmm. and uh, and and it's it's you know something actually made by a human. Mm -hmm. But then the 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 screen printing process also has these irregularities that can only be done by humans as well. Yeah. Yeah. and then and not um, only uh, not only humans, but not many humans. Can you can you give me a screen right. share, Jake? Yeah. Here's I'll put a screen. video. I could probably put a, a a separation video of of the of the from dust till dawn when I have more time, where I actually show. Okay, this is what layer one looks like. This is what layer two looks like. I've done that before with some of my old pieces. Yeah, that's so funny. <laughs> this is what happens when the average person tries to fill in <laughs> where where a master. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> For our listeners, Lee's showing the uh, the uh, the headline is "Elderly Woman Ruins Nineteenth Century Fresco and Restoration Attempt." It's the one where she <laughs> made Jesus look like a, a monkey, essentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's true. There, there are some, um, there are some like, uh, you know, I don't even know what they're called when they are on Instagram, and you can swipe through, and there's multiple pages, like the, the like the flip the flip books that they yeah. have on 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 Instagram. Mm -hmm. um, there's a few from back in the day of um, say my hateful eight poster for Mondo or, or my evil dead where I show, okay, this is what layer one looks like. And if mm. you could tell it's like yellow on white paper. And then here it is with a, another, I added transparent magenta on top and then transparent light blue and then transparent dark blue. And it adds up and adds up and adds up. And then you add the black at the end and like, Oh, now it is the poster that it, that it looks like when it's flat. And, mm -hmm. um, that might give you an idea into it. If I can plug my book, uh, I actually go by, I go in a, in a few tutorials in the book and, and show step by step how I separate uh, posters for screen printing that people mm -hmm. that like the technical stuff might find interesting. Um, mm -hmm. You can get the book through my website, my web store actually, which is linked through my website. Uh, mm -hmm. The book is called Visceral, The Art of Jason Edmiston. And it's also searchable on Amazon if you just look up Visceral. It basically is a, on my store, it's a link to Amazon anyway, so it doesn't matter. Uh, okay. but, uh, visceral, the art of Jason Edmondson, and it has that, um, that big eye from Texas chainsaw as the cover. So right, it's, yeah. it's, it's easy to spot, but I have multiple tutorial sections in there that show me, show you how I separate 
for posters. And I've actually heard that some artists that are in the business have used those two, those tutorials to teach themselves how to separate. <laughs> so it, I, I consider that a compliment, but um, it yeah. does take a lot of time uh, to do that. Um, but yeah. Well, that, I mean, that's uh, if you're looking for another revenue stream, you make a course on poster separation or how to be a poster artist, and then right, right, and then you educate the next generation of you, do that before you know as you're as you're getting ready to retire. I yeah, do yeah, I do yeah. Because I don't want the competition. The thing is, <laughs> I think with my technique in particular, because there are kind of technical techniques. Uh, John Smith from Mondo is their resident uh, poster separator for artists that. Mm-hmm. Uh, give them posters that are flat and that they don't do their own separations like Paul Mann or mm-hmm. um, who else? Uh, some other painters that maybe um, William Stout or somebody that would give them art that's just flat and fully colored that don't do their own separations. John Smith does those and he does them technically, w- which is the way I would describe to you with the uh, color separations and color range and all that. Uh, he is a designer, but he's not really a painter, say. So he does mm-hmm. it as a more technical way. And I've even had him separate some of my posters before when I didn't have time to. I'm approaching it more like a painter or an art restorer because I have that hand painted uh, or watercolor knowledge. Yeah, this is exactly what I did. Like even even that hateful eight that was painted full size acrylic, black and white only, because I knew I was mm-hmm. going to color it digitally. So I didn't even paint that in color. I, I painted the whole thing in black and white. And then as you go through and see the steps, you can see how I built it up to be yeah. the color poster that it ended in, it ended up being. You also That's notice there's a patch there because the Walt, Walton Goggins character, at, when I finished the poster, they didn't want him in that pose. So mm-hmm. they suggested I change it to this pose. So I did a patch where I painted him in a secondary image and then I patched him in later. So that's why there's two Walton Goggins in there. Interesting. Wow, that's it's so cool. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. It's it's so it's cool. fun because it was like a real challenge for me. My uh my art director or creative director at Mondo, uh Rob Jones, who's a famous uh Grammy award winning uh, uh graphic designer. Uh, he won for uh his work with uh, Jack White doing uh, Jack White's uh album covers. Mm-hmm. Um he's probably my biggest mentor uh in my career. And he used to compliment me uh he says it, you created this technique because you didn't know what you weren't supposed to do. Like I didn't know what I was doing at the time. I, I didn't even know how to sep- I didn't even know how to give a, a, a poster that was separated for print. And mm-hmm. Rob walked me through it over the phone and also had some help from my other poster artist friend, Brian Ewing, and a little bit from Kevin Tong. And they were talking about transparent colors in that. And I just kept messing around with it on my own and made my own technique. And he says, you invented this. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's because amazing. You didn't know what you're supposed to do because I do some kind of weird stuff. Other you know, other graphic designers are like, why are you doing that? That's it, that's really um, not the way it's supposed to be done. But as you guys know, using Photoshop all the time, there are no rules. It's just the mm-hmm. final result. There's there's a million different ways to skin a cat, as yeah. they say in Photoshop, right? So you just kind of play around with the tools until you uh, figure out what works. And if it prints okay, hey, then that's the way you do it. Right. Right. I have a question well, about some of your. Uh, sorry, Jake, cut you off. Um, uh, just a yeah. real, real quick question. Um, a lot of this stuff looks like you're taking, uh, you're doing uh, paintings after the movie has already been released, and you're kind of doing your version of it, or mm-hmm. uh, kind of an homage to it. Um, are you doing the actual posters for like new movies coming out? Uh, Hateful Eight was done before it was out for wide release. I saw a, a, a reviewer screener in New York. Uh, Mondo sent me there to see like an early screening of it. And I took notes and everything and I got reference. And I, I put out the poster, I think, to to be in time with the release of it. So, but it wasn't an official one. I mean, it was official, but it wasn't the one sheet that would go in the theaters. Uh, mm-hmm. I have, for the most part, it's um, kind of retroactive uh, pop culture, um, alternative movie posters where, oh, you already seen Invisible Man. It's been out for 50, 60 years. Here's a poster for it with full credits and everything. That's the majority of my business. But occasionally I will do a, a, uh, one sheet. Um, very rarely though, just because I, I just, I mean, the, I get hit up every now and then for it, but the, the, the stars haven't aligned where I've been free to do that job because it's usually a really quick 
turnaround. It's funny. Mm-hmm. They work on a movie for five years and then they need the, the poster for the movie within a month. <laughs> it's like, we're coming up next month. We need a poster. I'm like, why didn't you call me a year ago? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I did one for this movie called Manborg, which was a, uh, like a, a B movie in the style of, um, what was that movie that was maybe uh, it'd be the biggest kind of B movie like Psycho Gorman? It was actually made by the same director that made Psycho Gorman. If you've heard of that one, it's like a mm. or Turbo Kid. It's kind of like a big, a big B movie, but with a, a low budget, you know, a very mm-hmm. small crew. But I did the poster like it was one of those '70s kind of exploitation movie posters, and mm-hmm. that was the one sheet for the release. Um, but for the most part, I don't get hired for those type of jobs. I want to. That's kind of the hole in my, in my, um, if I could say the one thing that I have yet to do in my career is to do an official one sheet for a big movie. I know yeah. a lot of my peers have gotten hired to do that. So it's not like it's out of the realm of possibility. It's just the, the job offers haven't come when I've been free. Um, right. Or I haven't been the right style for them. Maybe they want something that's finished digitally so they can edit it heavily. But most of my paintings are are finished by hand um yeah even though i could finish it digitally i just i prefer to work traditionally for many reasons um you're but i'm friends with all the guys that work sure, for you're definitely now. on everybody's yeah. radar in that oh, scene thank i'm you. sure right. <laughs> I, oh, I appreciate that it's it's good to know that you're known by your peers um you know you, you're not quite aware of how how big your visibility is all the time um mm-hmm. so it's good to know when you hear that kind of feedback like oh yeah we know who you are and we've seen your work and everything i'm like okay cool and, you know, every now and then you get emails from famous people wanting posters and you're like, oh, wow. Okay. So I guess I have some sort of, you know, level yeah. of visibility and it's not, it's not the, the access to celebrities you want. It's the, well, if they know who I am, then the general public knows. And then that translates to print sales or gigs or whatever. That's, that's the ultimate goal for a working illustrator. You know, the kudos yeah. are bonus, but you know. Yeah. Awesome. It's amazing work. Well, Thank you so much. Yeah, we, we're going to wrap it up. We don't want to take too much of your time, but I want to I want to just close with 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 one one more question. This uh, this episode drops the, the beginning of the year, uh, and I'm wondering what you looking at this next year. Is there anything you're you have a goal to do, or you're shooting to accomplish, or you just like taking things as they come, or do you like do you plan out that yeah, far ahead? Yeah, I don't. I don't. Uh, well, loosely plan. I heard you guys talking about like a year plan the other day, and I mm-hmm. don't normally plan that far, far ahead, except I know I already have booked certain conventions. So I know that mm-hmm. I'm going to do certain conventions for the upcoming year. I'm doing designer con next month in Anaheim. I'm doing uh monster Palooza in Pasadena, uh horror hound in Cincinnati, things like that. I'll, I'll, I have my booth again for San Diego comic con next year. Mm-hmm. Um, so I do that every year in New York. So those are kind of the tent poles for my convention appearances. And I always have, I always try to plan seven to 10 new pieces for each of those shows. It, it basically is the, uh, is the carrot that I'm trying to reach for. And it also, mm-hmm. it forces me to have new work and it, and it has that steady beat for, um, for print sales. Um, that's a, a su- substantial part of my income. And amongst that, I have a regular gig with super seven, uh, at least currently doing, mm-hmm toy packaging, you know, once a quarter. And in addition to that, I, I'm planning on doing a couple posters for Mondo. I've already talked about doing, you know, my next say, you know, Universal Monsters poster in mm-hmm. that series. It's a, that ongoing series. Um, and uh, and I also, well, like if this, if this episode isn't gonna air until the new year, guys. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, well, I guess it's safe to say then the, the, the series that I am going to be, uh, um, doing officially with Mondo is Star Wars for my eyes. I knew it. (laughs) So I'm excited. I'm I'm really excited about that because if I had to sum up one property that is my go-to favorite character design property of all time, it's got to be Star Wars. Mm -hmm. I can't name another property that has uh, uh, the the wealth of of interesting character design from monsters to robots. uh, Such a range from size to color to shape everything. The the best the best character designers in the business, bar none. So I want to honor that. And we've already, I've already done uh, two images that will be released as a timed edition uh, coming up in either November or December. And then we're going to be starting a regular ongoing eyes series, hopefully building towards a big gallery show. So that's my Mm -hmm. big project that I guess is 
you know, the next two, three years of my life uh, peppered among all those other projects that I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially my year. Like, other than that, I don't really need much more because that's a, that's pretty, pretty much a lot. Like that's, you know, I don't know, 50, 60 pieces a year. Right. That's, that's all, that's all you can afford as an illustrator these days. Um, time-wise. Right. That's a Uh, ton. That is a ton. (laughs) That's a lot. It is. (laughs) So, um, yeah, I mean, it's exciting. And then in amongst that, I'm, I'm also selling, you know, archives, uh, archived prints on my store, or, um, I'm working on a book of my older eyes pieces, like a compendium of my, of my, you know, what I've made up to this point, including all the pencil work. Um, so, you know, right there, that's 600 images, easy, 650 images that I, you know, to make a picture book out of, Mm -hmm. um, and that's kind of a two, like a two year project. I've already got a, a publish. Well, I'm going to self publish it. You guys have been giving me some good information on your shows too. You guys are really good for, for working illustrators, giving good nuggets of, um, of inspiration. Cause you also, you, you know, gave me good ideas on how to promote and how to, how to get things published and the, the pluses and minuses of self publishing versus going through Amazon or whatever, or a publisher, uh, kickstarters, all this stuff that I'm mulling over all of this. Um, but I have that in the works as well. And I, I still haven't decided I might just fund the whole thing myself and just sell it. Um, but I was considering Kickstarter just so that I'm not out of pocket any, but Mm -hmm. as you guys know, you make your own books. It's expensive. I mean, even uh, you Lee with the, um, with the uh, tarot, uh, decks, I mean, the production cost in that must've been tens of thousands of dollars. So you might as well get that money up front with Kickstarter. If you can, I just, I don't, is there an episode that I should listen to, uh, how to do a Kickstarter that you guys have put out? Yeah, like, we've done, uh, I, I don't have it off the top of my head, but um, we have talked Kickstarter in the past. And I would I would recommend it because it's such a, there's such a virality to the work that you create mm-hmm. that if you launch that Kickstarter, especially if everything's licensed, because that's yeah. the big, uh, you know, that's the, like the, the big problem is you might launch something that isn't licensed and now right. Kickstarter is going to just shut it down and, and that's oh, a I disaster. See. Right. But, right. Um, but you know, if you can if, say, you know, this is official book, uh, you know, everything in here is, is, uh, is above board. Um, it is the, 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 the people on Kickstarter who back Kickstarters are the, the Venn diagram is almost no two circles. It's like one circle. <laughs> people who love your work and people who back Kickstarters. <laughs> right, it's right, a, right. It's a circle, right? right it's yeah. true. So what you're going to do is you're going to double the amount of books that you would sell a pre-sell, essentially. Oh, I see. Okay. You're going to gotcha. launch it. Kickstarter is going to see, oh, this is, this is clearly something impressive, you know, that people are interested in. They're going to put all of their marketing power behind it as well. Because if gotcha. you make money, they make money. And, oh, and you're going to, you're going to do incredibly well. So I would, I would definitely do a Kickstarter. However, it's a ton of work and, and definitely clear your schedule for that month. Like just oh, wow. this month, okay. I'm right. only doing the Kickstarter. Okay. Um, okay. But it'll be fair worth enough. it. You'll, you'll make your, your income for the year. <laughs> okay. All right. Fair enough. Okay. I'm going to look into that. Thank you. Yeah. I've, I've been going over all your old episodes too. So um, I like how they, some podcast channels don't do this, but for whatever reason, when I listen to you guys through Spotify, if I listen to one episode and it ends, it goes right into the episode that's the next newest. Oh, or, yeah. You know, yeah. So I just chains. And so, and that's the direction I'm going. Like I kind of started at the bottom and then I just kind of go up and you know, play, play, play. Okay. Here's one I haven't listened to. And then just daisy chains into the next one above it. So I, I listen to you guys like three hours at a clip. So you guys are, are definitely in my head most of the day. Right so on. I appreciate it. Yeah. Sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> That's okay. I'm getting used to all the, uh, all the in jokes now too. Yeah. We're knuckleheads. So. <laughs> well, dude, it's, it's good to have you on. This is great. Thanks for, uh, you know, I'm glad we were able you. to connect through Instagram. Yeah. Yeah. Pleasure to meet you. Uh, I absolutely appreciate you reaching out and, um, and this is good. We'll, we'll let you go. Awesome. Thank you so much, guys. Really okay. flattered that you guys would uh, take the time to talk to me. Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. See you later. Good luck. All right. We just got done with uh, Jason Edmiston. Uh, cool guy, man. He he was like, I, I just learned so much from him about how to approach a career, how to, um, like I said at the beginning, how to be deliberate about what you want to do and the choices you need to make. 
Um, I want to make sure you check out his social media uh, Instagram, which is at Jason uh, Edmiston Art. So at Jason Edmiston, it's E D M I S T O N uh, Art. So that's where he's, he keeps it updated. Go to his website, which is um, uh, jasonedmiston.com, and then also check out his book which came out, which is, uh, what's it called? Visceral, The Art of Jason Edmiston, which uh, collects a bunch of his poster work that he's done, um, licensing art that he's done, toy packaging, uh, and even, like he said, is, has this uh, kind of a tutorial on how he does color separation, which is super interesting. Um, so yeah, this is this is good. I'm glad we we got this guy on the on the show because it definitely shows you the range of possibilities for working artists and illustrators. What what's out there? What's possible? Like he is such a a niche artist, but in that niche, he's absolutely thriving. Um, right. And it doesn't so, have to be a huge niche. He's got all this work and he's just like, he just does one thing really, really good, which kind of backs up what we talk about a lot on our mm-hmm. podcast is, you know, that one thing I, I'm jealous of him actually, because he's so focused on the one thing. Like for me, I'm mm-hmm. kind of uh, hyper uh, focused on different areas at different times. Yeah. And the second I'm on one thing, I'm kind of already thinking about the next thing that's totally different. Right. But he's just got, he's got his gig and he knows what to do and he knows how to do it. Um, and he definitely gets it done, man. And he's successful and still prolific. Like I'm, I feel lazy now compared to how I used to <laughs> illustrate work and like, but he said he's going to do how many images did he say this year? 60. Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's paintings. more than one a week if he doesn't take any time off, you know? <laughs> <laughs> and these are not quick. These are, these aren't fake paintings like I make where you're just drawing a stick figure. These are <laughs> right. real paintings where <laughs> this is rendered stuff. <laughs> Will Terry would love would love his rendering. In fact, he wanted to be here, but he ended up having to do some work. So, all right, I'm going to take us out. Everybody, thank you for joining us today. Three Point Perspective is made possible by svslearn.com, where becoming a great illustrator starts. Your hosts have been Will Terry, Lee White, Jake Parker. Uh, Like I said, uh, Will Terry couldn't join us. He's out on assignment, but you could find his work at willterry.com. Lee White can be found at leewhiteillustration.com, and I'm over at mrjakeparker.com. Uh, podcast produced by Daniel Tu, that's Daniel T-U, and you can find his work at daniel2.co. Uh, special thanks to Keeper of the Curriculum, Austin Shirtliff, Show Notes Wrangler, Lily Howell, Chief Operations Officer, Lisa Fott, and uh, lastly, I just want to say, go draw something. <laughs>